Jua Koto. I'm not sure if this is working actually, um, but uh, d distinguished guests and um, new fellows, uh, award winners, my colleagues, family and friends. Great. <laughs> I'm, I'm deeply honoured to be able to address you today as you celebrate your fellowship of general practice. So my own career has been a wonderful journey and I'd like to share with you some of the places it's taken me and some of the directions you may travel in your chosen profession. I'm an avid traveller and my husband and I love to explore new places, be it overseas countries, travelling around New Zealand in our camper van, tramping in the mountains or kayaking our many coastlines, rivers and lakes. So looking back, I can see that my career has also been a journey with new experiences and new directions of travel. There's been bends in the road where new opportunities have opened up for me to explore different roles. Now, I've always been drawn to community-based care and family medicine. And Rex Hunton was an early mentor for me at medical school. He was a physician and senior lecturer with the community health department. Uh, we didn't have a department of general practice in those days. So Rex emphasised the whole person approach looking at the health of people within the context of their community. And Rex and I have kept in touch, and he now lives in Kirikiri with Valerie, his wife, and this is some of her artwork at their home. I had a summer studentship under Rex's supervision. My study looked at the health of people living in rural communes. And so this was in the 1970s, so these were really prevalent. And it involved both the physical and mental well-being of people within the context of their families, their community, and their physical environment. I took this photo of a young girl who was born in a community called Long Louis Land. I spent my three months training into an elective in the Hokianga. As well as working in the local hospital in Ramani, I ran GP clinics throughout the region, and the wise and experienced nurses there taught me heaps. After I'd been there, about a week, the only doctor became ill and he was transferred to Whangarei Hospital. So I became the acting superintendent of Rawani Hospital for two weeks. <laughs> and I was, it never happened these days, but I was supported by the nurses and by an evening phone call from the base hospital. And there were, there were, there were really no, no serious mishaps. This was, um, this was being thrown in at the deep end, but I gained many, many skills. So, Making house calls, I think, is one of the most privileged aspects of general practice, and I urge you the opportunity to see patients in their homes whenever you can. And my most memorable one took a whole weekend, and I'd run a clinic at a remote Maori settlement of Miti Miti, um, and I was asked if I would visit a Farnell member who would not come to the doctor. So on the Friday night, I took my Morris Minor van across the car ferry to, uh, from Rawini and drove back to Miti Miti and I stayed with the family there for a weekend. And on Saturday, we rode horses up the beach and into the Pauranga forest. And there we visited a young family who lived in the bush. And I managed to persuade the father to come into hospital the following week to get his type one diabetes under control. We stopped on the way home to collect giant mussels off the rocks for dinner. Now, it's an amazing career that can allow you to have special experiences like this. And you can also use your medical degree as a great way to travel. While I was a house surgeon in Whangarei, I wrote to shipping companies uh, to get a job to take me to England. I didn't actually get one, but I did get two months as a ship surgeon on a cruise ship called the Marco Polo, and we travelled around the Far East. An excellent Australian trained nurse and I were responsible for the care and wellbeing of all the passengers and all the crew. And our, our mostly elderly passengers often indulged in too much eating, drinking, smoking, and, and otherwise living it up. And we were thankful that they all made it home alive. So a, medical, a New Zealand medical degree is very well respected, and it gives you the opportunity to work in many different countries. And so I had no trouble getting locum positions in a number of London hospitals once I finally made it there. My first GP job ever was in Blind Gwynvie, which is a mining village in South Wales. And I shared the roster cover uh, with a, a GP from the neighbouring village. And he was incredibly inspiring, and he taught me that the, the people most likely to need health care are the least likely to receive it. His name's Julian Tudor Hart. 
Now, it was a long time later when I was back in New Zealand that I learned that Julian's actually an icon of general practice in the UK, and this inverse care law was really famous. So a couple of years ago, my husband and I had the great pleasure and privilege of staying with Julian and his wife in their cottage in South Wales. So I, I was really inspired by Julian, and I decided to work in a third world country where the healthcare need was, you know, where healthcare was really needed. And after a bitter winter in London, I wanted somewhere warm. And I picked Jamaica because I also loved reggae music. <laughs> and I wrote to the Ministry of Health of the Jamaican government and I offered my services and then I signed a two-year contract. I spent the first six months practicing obstetrics in the Victoria Jubilee Lying In Hospital. And the barbed wire there in the photograph is because the hospital's in the ghetto and it had armed guards at the entrance. So there were two political parties in Jamaica and different parts of the ghetto were affiliated with either one or the other. And there were frequent gun wars. And sometimes the gangs would come and they'd, they'd, they'd attempt to enter the hospital to finish off someone that wounded but not killed, which is why they had the guards. But being a doctor can allow you to go safely where other people can't. And I used to work in Operation Friendship clinics in the ghettos in Kingston. And I did this in both political areas so that I was seen as non-partisan. And so local people would give me safe pack passage and they'd escort me down these corrugated iron alleyways and then they'd wrap on a piece of iron um, that would be moved aside and allow me to enter the opposing area. And then new escorts would appear for me. And so I was never in any harm, but my guides wouldn't dare to enter their enemy's territory. So after that, I was a GP for a health centre in the hills just out of Kingston, where they hadn't had a doctor for many years. Uh, we had 20,000 people in our catchment area, and I saw up to 80 patients a day, but I help, had help from a great team of auxiliary staff. <coughs> so being a GP means you, get a, you may be invited to help at, at sports and arts events and festivals, and this can have lots and lots of rewards. So in Jamaica, I was the doctor for the Reggae Sunsplash Festival, where I got to meet some of my favourite reggae stars. And, um, and a few years later, I was doctor at the uh, New Zealand Sweetwaters Festival. Uh, and as a GP, you obviously you can have considerable choice about the community you work in, um, especially if you're interested in underserved groups. So since returning to New Zealand, I've worked in a number of community settings as a, as a GP and a primary care doctor, often with high needs patients. And I had a practice in Freeman's Bay before it became yuppified. Um, and so it had a wonderfully diverse patient uh, population, which included artists and responteurs, lots of Maori, some Pacific and other immigrant groups, residents at halfway houses, shelters and hostels, and a large gay population. And as well as general practice, I've worked in family planning and sexual health clinics, both in Jamaica and Auckland. And throughout my career, I've always relied heavily on the advice and assistance of other health professionals, but especially nurses, and I've always valued the team approach to primary care. And being a GP can also lead you to working in, in, in a no, number of other interesting places. So I've worked in a locum capacity at both Mount Eden and Paramaramu uh, prisons. And in many ways, this is a very similar pa patient population to those at the City Mission and the other halfway houses. Uh, patients with high mental health needs and with issues with substance misuse. And I worked as a police doctor both in Jamaica and in Auckland. And I helped set up the, uh, the Auckland Sexual Abuse Help Foundation. Uh, and I recruited some women GPs uh, to cover the roster and arranged our training in forensic examinations where there were allegations of sexual abuse and rape. And two forensic scientists and I published a, a book for doctors on how to conduct these forensic sexual assault examinations. And having worked uh, as an expert for the Crown for a number of years, I became increasingly concerned about some new policies, practice and legislation which supported a presumption of guilt. And this has led me to working as a medical advisor or an expert witness for the defence on occasion. And in forensic work, it's really important to keep an open mind. An allegation may be true, but it also may be false and everyone's entitled to a fair trial. So what's required is an objective and comprehensive examination of, of the evidence. And in 1993, I published this rather provocative book on the causes and implications of false allegations. 
And I've been involved in some uh, quite high profile cases. For, um, for example, I was the medical advisor in the case of George Guaze, who was twice prosecuted and twice acquitted of murdering his young niece, who actually died of natural causes subsequent to congenital HIV. And th there is huge satisfaction to be had in helping prevent a grave miscarriage of justice. And as a GP, you can also choose to have um, dual vocational qualifications. So as well as being a fellow of the Royal New Zealand College of GPs, I'm also a forensic physician as a fellow of the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine of the UK Royal College of Physicians. And many New Zealand GPs are also members of the Division of Rural Medicine or fellows of the Urgent Care College. And some GPs also train uh, in other specialties such as public health or palliative care. Um, in, in about um, uh, in the 1990s, um, a particular um, course uh, run out of the University of Otago caught my interest, uh, and it was um, about the nature of general practice. Uh, so I enrolled, and this started me along a path of academia. And I completed a Master's of General Practice at the University of Otago, and then in 2000, I started part-time contract work conducting research at the University uh, of Auckland in the Department of General Practice and Primary Health Care. So without actually planning it, uh, I began to morph into an academic. And, and in 2010, I actually got a full-time uh, tenured position uh, as a professor and I was awarded the Goodfellow Chair. And, and I really love conducting research that can make a difference to either our practice or our policy. Uh, research has afforded me many opportunities for exploration and also for collaboration with a wide range of colleagues. So I'm quite passionate about primary care research, which can help us confirm that what we're doing is best practice or indicate where we need to make changes in what we do. And it, it's still a very new discipline, although here in New Zealand we're much more advanced than in some developing countries, uh, where they face challenges providing primary care, let alone primary care research. And this year I, I got to co-edit um, a book in International Perspectives of Primary Care Research. And this includes case studies about this discipline in 21 countries around the world. Um, and as a GP, um, you may be asked to sit on a wide range of committees which can help influence national policy or practice. And so these might be advisory groups for the Ministry of Health or for Pharmac or for ACC or, or government review committees, for example. And in the past, I've sat on a number of these, um, such as advisory groups on pain management for ACC and cervical screening for the ministry. And if you get the opportunity to do this, I, said, you know, I really recommend you take it up. And one of the best aspects of this sort of involvement is meeting people from other disciplines and getting to understand the issues from their perspectives. And in, in 2008, um, I was asked to be the editor of the Royal New Zealand College uh, Journal, the uh, New Zealand Family Physician. And this, journey, this uh, journal had been published for 35 years, but it hadn't ever attained midline listing. So I was allowed to retire the New Zealand Family Physician, and in, nine, in 2009, I became the founding editor of its replacement, which is, I named the Journal of Primary Health Care. And this was an amazing opportunity for me. It was, it was truly marvellous because um, I got to design a whole journal from scratch and not only decide its content, but also how it looked. Um, it was right down to the type of font and the amount of white space and the look of the cover and the layout and the graphics for the, for the columns. Um, and I was aided by a, a wonderful graphic designer at the college, Robin Atwood, and she took my scrappy little sketches and ideas and she turned them into, into these elegant designs. But of course, the reason why the journal succeeded was because so many of my primary care academic colleagues from many disciplines, not just general practice, throughout New Zealand and beyond, and they put their trust in it. And so they submitted their research, they provided other content, and they peer reviewed the papers. And, and because of them, we achieved Medline Listing after one year of publication, and the journals continued to thrive. And last year, I passed it on to a new editor, uh, Professor Dovey over there, who just got her um, honorary fellowship. <coughs> and teaching is an integral part of general practice. And, and so first of all, we educate us for our patients. And this can be one-on-one. -on -one. 
and mostly, of course, it is one-on-one, -on -one, but it can also be in groups. And, and in Jamaica, a visit to the doctor would take all day. Um, and patients would they'd come early in the morning and mostly on foot. Um, and then they'd sit in the compound under the shade of a mango tree waiting for a consultation. And food stores would set up to feed them for the day. Um, so we had this sort of captive audience. Um, and so I taught my community workers to give health talks to those waiting. And they taught, gave talks on things like healthy eating and how to treat diarrhea in children. So that was a really a, a, an early experience for me of, of teaching, um, uh, more than just my one-to-one -one in general practice. But I also supervised medical students in my Freeman's Bay practice. And then my, my work with the Help Foundation uh, led me to teaching groups of doctors and other professionals on, on clinical and forensic uh, matters related to sexual abuse. So in my, my university position, which I have now, my teaching involves both undergraduate and postgraduate courses, but as well as supervising masters and doctoral students. Uh, my recent role in two international organisations, so I'm, I'm chair of the International Committee of the North American Primary Care Research Group called NAPCRAG, it's a long title, and I'm also the incoming chair of the Wonka Working Party on Research. And this affords me the privilege of being able to understand how primary care is delivered across the globe, so both in resource-rich but also resource-poor nations. And it, it, it gives me the opportunity to play a role um, in growing research capacity in developing countries. So, so all of you are on the cusp, your new fellows are on the cusp of a new career. And your primary role will be the ongoing care of patients and their families, a building enduring relationships within your community. But you know, general practice has changed in the last 40 years since I graduated as a doctor. And a few of you will be now practicing obstetrics or providing 24 hour cover. And family planning, sexual health, urgent care clinics and hospices may provide some of your patients acute care. And many of your patients, as we know, will now have um, long-term and multiple conditions. And you'll be working in a, a team environment with colleagues from different disciplines and with complementary skills. Uh, so you may not be um, a business owner, but you may work sessions on a salary. And this can afford you the opportunity to extend your practice into other areas. So you can be a leader, a, a connector, a communicator, a facilitator, a coordinator, working with your patients to make the best decisions for their care and well-being. So, doesn't always want to go. Um, you may choose to develop an advanced competency and do postgraduate courses in topics such as palliative care or travel medicine or mental health and qualify with a postgraduate qualification or a diploma at the University of Auckland or Otago. Uh, there are many other areas you may choose to upskill in, um, from demoscopy to minor surgery to motivational interviewing to CBT. And, and, many, and many skills probably as yet unknown. And, and you may um, uh, wish to take the postgraduate study further and enrol in a master's or PhD and discover the joy of research. And some of you may then choose an academic career. So many doors will open for you. And there's a number of coordination and leadership roles in organisations such as PHOs, DHBs or the college. And as the shape and breadth of primary care evolves, there are many other positions as yet as known which will also open up. So a major component of my role as the head of Department of General Practice is to ensure that there are sufficient high quality general practices to train our medical students. So most of all, I encourage you to help grow the next generation of GPs. And the word doctor means someone who teaches from the Latin decere, to teach. And ours is very much a master apprenticeship model. Now New Zealand has a goal of 50% of our medical graduates to choose general practice. And so for this, they have to have positive and rich experiences um, in general practice in community-based uh, settings. Um, and you don't need to do this on your, on your own. You can involve your colleagues and other members of your team and in the practice and in the wider community. So um, one of our medical student writes, um, I had a fantastic time on my year four rural GP placement. 
I was able to have exposure in the setting of the practice, both with the doctors and the nurses, with the community nurses, including Plunkett, the St John team, and in the community at an Older People's Health Expo. I really felt part of the team and that I contributed positively to the practice. My experience definitely consolidated my interest in rural health. Now that's one of the differences that you can make. Uh, and this, this photo is a photo of a student working at one of the health stands taking blood pressure at the Waitangi Day Festival. And she writes, Maori health is one of my passions, especially its intersection with general practice. So for me, Northland has been great in exposing us to te ao Maori and the beauty of it. And finally, a student sent me this picture to use in this presentation. And she said, I did my rural GP attachment in the Hokianga for seven weeks. The attachment was absolutely amazing and confirmed my desire to work in rural general practice. So there's many rewards to be had from inspiring young doctors and providing a general practice role model. I encourage you all to include teaching as a routine part of your clinical practice. Have a wonderful journey. Namihi, kia pai, tahari. Thank you.